paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. They may look like humans, but to many, teenagers seem like an alien species. They've got their own language. Their own strange habitats. And their own weird customs. They think of themselves as being in the centre of the universe. Whoa! In a way, they feel they're bulletproof. Teenagers, even normal ones seem hellish, and hellish ones are almost the norm. The school bus run. It's safe, dependable, and, well, it's slow, but at least nothing can possibly go wrong. Or could it? For bus company boss Terry, it had started out a normal afternoon. He'd sent one of his drivers on a new school route, but then things started to go wrong. He stopped at what he thought was the stop. He wasn't quite sure. So he thought he'd get out of his bus, walk over the playing field and just confirm it with a teacher that was stood at the other side of the playing field. But while Terry's driver was off getting directions, a group of youths were crowding around the bus. We were all, like, laughing and joking, just like normal. I didn't think when I was doing it. And we didn't plan it. Terry still finds the CCTV footage difficult viewing. There they go. Some discussion has taken place. Obviously, he's getting a bit of pressure put on him by his friends. I got on the bus. They were telling my mate to get off. The rest of my mates, I just didn't listen. I wish I would have listened to that one. I said, are you sure you're not? Do you know what you're doing? He said, yeah, just let me think for a minute. Do you know, just let me get used to it. And then you were all right. There you go. He's actually started it. The two kids had made off with the school bus. He did it. Just started trying to drive it. For the driver, the day was going from bad to disastrous. He couldn't run after it. He's not an Olympic athlete at the end of the day. By the time we were running over to it, it had gone. I can understand him stealing a car. You can sell it. What are you going to do? You can't sell a bus. You're going to advertise it in Yorkshire Trader. See her running up and down the bus, having a wonderful time. She's enjoying every minute of it. I was excited because I was doing it. I've never done it before. First experience. There were uh, people looking at us. They looked shocked. Thankfully, they've not hit anything or anybody so far. Three miles away, unsuspecting foster parent Doreen Earth was having a relaxing afternoon before the kids came back from school. It's been just a, a normal day. I'd just settled down for the afternoon. I'd just finished all my, what I had to do. I can just chill out and do nothing, just have it for me. Now two miles away and gaining speed, the bus was damaging parked cars. I did think we could get hurt. I thought we were going to get hurt. I was saying to him, I think we better get off now. Let's get off before, it, you know, bad happens or worse it happens. Then the two joyriders decided to do something really shocking. You can see the bus is still moving. It's now driverless. It's now driverless. The kids ran for it, leaving the empty bus to career down the hill. Now pretty much anything could happen. They just quite happily left this bus up to its own fate. But it's just wickedness. It's just pure wickedness. The washer set off on a spin, because when it spins, it really takes off. <laughs> I just thought it was a washer. I sat up, and the house was all dark. 
I just froze. I just didn't know what it was. I thought the thing was coming in the house. By this time, I was shaking like a leaf. Got to the window, and there's this big bus flaked right across my window. I just panicked, cos I thought it could have blown up. This is every bus operator's nightmare, this. I cannot believe that, 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 that there's somebody out there capable of doing it. It was all hell let loose. Everything was happening. There was police, police on horseback, helicopter, bus people. I'm surprised it didn't come in. I mean, that's so close, it's untrue. Four days later, the teenagers were tracked down. They were caught, banged to rights. They were a camera on box. They've no excuse. They can't talk the way out of that. How can they talk the way out of that? They couldn't. And the courts gave the 15-year-old driver an antisocial behaviour order that bans him from the area, while 15-year-old Laura got probation. But does she feel any remorse? I just think, why didn't I think first before I did it? And then I thought after, what if somebody were coming out of the house because she fosters kids, that woman? And I thought, well, what if someone were driving down the street or something? And we would have killed somebody. It was good at the time. Now, when I think back and picture what I've done, I won't do it ever again. But it's going to take a while longer for Terry to forgive and forget. I just wish we could say, look, look at what you've done. I, I, I hope you're happy. I hope you can sleep nights. I just hope that there is a God. Uh, and oh, I'm getting upset. Can you turn it off? <laughs> this group of lads from the Northwest are trying to make a big name for themselves. Mikey is their leader. Conway's his right-hand man. Gary has dreams of stardom. And Birchie is the joker. I think they think they're going to get famous, do they? But unlike the parents of other aspiring stars, this mum wants her boy to stop. If he pally's on, I'm going to get the police myself to come out and speak to Angie. A clue to her concerns lies in the tools of their trade. A fish hook, some aftershave, a lighter, a video camera, and most importantly, one of these. This crew call themselves Live Now, Die Later, and this is what they do. And this is their safer stuff. Most of their stunts should come with a health warning. At Christmas, I got a camcorder and just started um, going on from there doing stunts, pranks, and um, more people, more of my mates just wanted to join in. And um, about two years later, we started the website off. With video cameras getting cheaper, more groups can now afford to film their own stunts. Extreme stunt scene, it's been around for a long time and, it's, you know, kids have been doing things that most adults don't even know is going on, you know. They probably do them, go home, parents don't know what they've been doing, you know. They think, what, where'd that bruise come from? It's in his ear! Mikey doesn't just film stunts, he stars in them too. This is the hook on fishing line. I had string attached to the hook. Check the hook! And there, uh, the string was attached to the other end on the uh, gate. And I got one of the mates to uh, kick the gate. Kick it now. Oh. It broke the oh. oh. When it got kicked, the string snapped and it, it stayed in here and just ripped a bit of the ear. <laughs> what a bit! <laughs> Mikey wasn't badly injured, but even simple stunts can cause permanent damage. 14 year old Ben is in a rival group based in Bristol. I was supposed to get slapped ten times and uh, my friend on the seventh go. <laughs> oh, my God! <laughs> he slapped me right in the ear. He's supposed to slap me in the cheek. Oh, I've got a ring in my ear now. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went to doctors and I had a uh, busted eardrum. He'd probably permanently actually have something wrong with his ear. Probably be like that for the rest of my life. Maybe they don't enjoy it at the time, but at least it's something they can brag about, which is what kids want. But LNDL wanted to push their stunts to the limit. Mikey's sight is really extreme with all extreme stunts. In a way, they feel they're bulletproof. They aren't going to be the ones that are going to get caught. They aren't going to be the ones that are going to end up injured. 
But when former LNDL member Joe Armstrong jumped over a bonfire, the stunt went horribly wrong. The 10-year-old was rushed to hospital after suffering major burns to his chest and thighs that will scar him for life. Teenagers who play with fire are basically dicing with death. And if something goes wrong, as it inevitably will one day, then even if they survive, uh, they are likely to be very badly burned. The group think they've learned from the horrendous accident. Hopefully we've learned from our mistakes and that it won't happen again. I say like, to other kids not to do it because you can get really badly hurt. They mess about with fire all the time and I do feel like doing some of their stunts, but Mum really doesn't want me to do any of them. Lisa is the mother of Andrew Birch, nicknamed Birchie. She hasn't thing? seen the website. She's never actually seen any of my stunts. Well, she will do soon, so <laughs> I'd be devastated. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Mum. You will be. Andrew has agreed to show her the footage for the first time. I think it's disgusting. You should know better. Oh, my God, and you think this is funny? Yeah. I'm disgusted in you, Angie. What do you think your nan and Kevin are going to say when they've seen this? Do you think they're going to be proud of you? No, cos they're not. They're going to be ashamed. You're so stupid. You've got nothing to say about that. Nothing at all. You're not ashamed of yourself. Well, I would be, if I was you, Andrew, you couldn't really hate yourself. Sorry. Just stop doing it. Rice. Oh, I can't believe you, Andrew. It seems Birch's stunt career is over, but the other lads are determined to continue. It'd be great if um, I could make a living out of it. The group wants its hobby to go mainstream, but in the meantime, any child with a PC has access to this disturbing craze. Sarah Ryder lives in the suburbs. She goes to a nice school. She lives in a nice house. What more could any 16-year-old want? Well, what she wants is an evening of music and entertainment with her friends. Tomorrow, I'm going to be having a party. Don't really know what's going to happen, but normally we end up, whatever we're doing, having a fun time together, something crazy involved happening. This will be Sarah's first house party, and Mum Jocelyn has agreed to go away for the weekend. What I want to do is just walk out the door late afternoon and just forget about it till late afternoon, evening on Sunday. Yeah. And know that everything's sorted out. Yeah, that's fine. Rather than you think, oh dear, I haven't done any food at about nine o'clock on the Saturday night. You're not going to buy any drink? Um. Or maybe get a couple of bottles of beer or cider, something cheap. Mm. I don't mind what happens. It's the, I've just got a few in particular requisites that I've said. No shoes upstairs, no one in my bedroom. No Drinks glass on. marks on my beautiful oak furniture. Um, and that's about it. I'll make sure the dog is fed and let out. A girl's first house party is the suburban equivalent of the debutante's ball. To help our experts analyse this important social phenomenon, Sarah is going to film the entire event. Are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? It's probably not quite what Mum had in mind, but at least things are getting off to a lively start. I think we've got about three bottles of vodka, 40 bottles and cans of beer, blackcurrant liqueur, Malibu, um, coffee Five liqueur, bottle. vodka. The parties are an extreme form of, of social grouping, and when you put people together, there's always a, a sense of competition. And with these teams, that means drinking. The aim is to drink as much as you can, as quickly as you can. But also getting drunk's a kind of um, a badge of honour. <laughs> That's right, Sam, get ready! Oh, shit! My friend will be fine! <laughs> but best mate Bradley... No, it's fine! ..is also keen to get noticed. 
brains continue to develop right through into adolescence, and the bit that's the very last to develop is the, the bit at the front, which is the bit that controls um, outrageous behaviour. Are you hungry? Uh, There's yes. food right there. <laughs> Why don't you eat it? That, that was from the dog bowl. They know that. this. Dog bowl. Brad, just put your head in the bowl. <laughs> you have to eat yeah. it out Well, of eight out of ten teenagers say they prefer it. What like the golden f***ing hell? Really right there. With Bradley recovering outside, it's now up to Duff to take centre stage. He's going to dance. He's put himself up there in front of everybody in a very, very exposed position. Is this music going to happen anytime soon? Come on, fast music. <laughs> I think he's just going to go crazy. Like or is he just going to carry on like this for the next four minutes? He's seen as brave, he's seeing some, doing something a bit crazy, and that raises his interest in the eyes of, of a female. Not this time. Have you, have you puked? Ew, it's all like you. <laughs> have you puked? I've never been sick from drink and I have now. They're beginning to develop an identity and trying to work out who they are, and that might include doing things that they'd never done before. So do you feel complete now? I feel complete. Well, I feel complete. Well. <laughs> Uh, like, don't have pants. Oh my God, this is my bra! There's a whole range of things that cause them to look for a thrill, to get noticed, to be noticed by family, to be noticed by peers, and just to, to get a shock, to get an experience, to see what it's like. It's been one hell of an evening. Sarah and her pals have demolished three bottles of spirits, one bottle of liqueur, and gallons of beer. All right, Bradley, he's having fun. Go and see Paul, he's having fun. All right, Paul. What children do is a lot of the time they get drunker quicker because their physiology, their bodies aren't, don't have the uh, neurochemicals, the enzymes that break alcohol up. Oh, it's half past five in the morning. <laughs> there probably aren't any neurochemicals left. Two people have been sick and now one of them has crashed out in mum's bed. Altogether, the complete teenage party. The only problem is that Mum's due back in about five hours' time. It's the next morning, and the house seems suspiciously tidy. Oh, not much to do. Oh, drinks cabinet. You've only drunk the Malibu, which I've been looking for a home for for ages. That's good. <laughs> Anyone left upstairs? It looks nice, dear. I'm proud of you. You've done well. Oh, you can have another one then if you, uh, if it's gone so well. Whatever their situation, most families present a calm public face. But behind closed doors, it's all too easy for emotions to boil over. This is the home of the Turner family. Here's 16 year old Kay, 13 year old Amber. And Mum Donna. No, you have to stay, Kay. She's got one of those. Why do you have to be different? She put her middle finger up, thank you. How the hell could you hear put her middle finger up? With two warring teenagers, it's not exactly happy families. You, you had your back turned. I would have heard this. She did, she had... No, you bloody didn't. We've actually had violence against each other, like, when we've had, like, slapping and before I've pulled her hair and all that, so... Sometimes it's like important things, but other than that, it's just silly little things that just trigger it off between us both. They just don't get along. They just do not get along. Kay's got a part-time job while she waits for exam results, while Amber spends her time winding up her big sister. Oh, that's disgusting. So are you. Oh, Amber, do you know what? Don't, don't start. My life, what can I say about it? I get up, go work, come back, go out, come in, have an argument with my mother, have an argument with my sister, go back out again in the ump, and then come back in and go to bed. It's typical, simple life, really. This is a family that needs help. No, you cannot. In two days, no. they'll be visiting no, no, an expert no, no. teen counsellor. So we followed them for a weekend to find out what the problems are. Well, as you can see, my bedroom ain't exactly big. It's a small bedroom. You see how like, tight the space is in the 
when we're both together, you can see where all the arguments start, but sometimes they do turn serious, like the other day when she called me a slag. <laughs> and that was it, I set, her, I set off on one. I got her by her red mate and she went, hey, call me a little slag, and I did hit her head against the wall. Dad, it's hard to just stay in the same room together, especially when it all that happens. But Amber's got temper problems of her own. Really? Best friend Claire is usually first to hear about the latest outburst. I hit a teacher in the face. My geography teacher. Was it by accident or on purpose? Well, it was sort of a bit of both, on purpose and by accident, because she really, really does wind me up sometimes, so I really felt really about... pleased with hitting her. Shut up. And it's not just violence that worries Donna. My daughter, my eldest one, yeah, she come in all red-eyed under there, you know what I mean? I'm saying to her, Kate, are you smoking anything? Oh, no, I've been sitting with my friends. Oh, they were Daddy. smoking. And then she's like, just chill, Mum. You know, you just because they do stupid things, you think I'm going to do it. You know I'm talking about you. Well, I don't. Miss Red-Eye. Yes, you do. I don't. I mean, there can be some moments when it's good, and there can be some moments when, like, me and my mum can get along, but that's very rare. Like, that's once in a blue moon that happens. With tantrums, squabbles and trouble at school, Donna is reaching the end of her tether. Oh, why does this crap always happen to me? It always, always, always. But help could be at hand. In a last-ditch measure, the family have reluctantly agreed to an intensive counselling session. What's the song? Things can only get better. Meet the teen tamer. She's an ex-copper who now counsels troubled teens and their families. Even the most difficult cases have responded well to Sarah Newton's no-nonsense approach. But will the teen tamer have met her match with the Turners? Before the meeting, she watched the footage we'd shot of the family. Ames, what did I tell you about wankers like that? Boyfriends are a major no, problem no, area. At the end of the day, you should have fucking just kicked him in his products. <laughs> This is not communicating, this is just each of them shouting at each other about something, again, that's actually quite serious. A 22-year-old man has given 13-year-old Amber his phone number. You should have went to him, see that? Fuck And I went, do you mind you? But I don't know you. And he went, oh, don't mind, just keep it like that. Just one call, just one call. What is the other? Shush. <laughs> Sarah is going to give them one-to-one -one counselling before the all-important group meeting. It is. Is this, is this, is this, the girls get stuck into Sarah's exercises, but the real test is how they'll communicate as a family. I want you to think about all of you. Now, they've decided nice they're going to do a respect board, and exactly. they split it into three. And each day, you just go and write something that you appreciate or respect about that person. No, that I and it just actually changes the attitude of the house from this, like, mm. you know, screaming, shouting, to actually, well, hang on a minute. Okay. We're actually all OK. We're not that bad. I mean, that one them, I know it go. works. Oh, the big oh, test so is going to be whether Mum can take it on. Can't, can't see it. Can't see it at all working, honestly. She may see them as teens from hell, and yeah, we've seen that, and they are, but how did they get that way? Gonna have to ask her some really difficult questions. Right, well, here we all are. I don't want this to be like us all attacking each other, okay. because I think there's been too much of that happening in the house already. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're very clear what you want from both of them. Mm -hmm. What are you willing to change about yourself? I'll try not to get so stressed out. Mm -hmm. And you finding this difficult? Yeah, aren't you? yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah, I know. I can see you shaking and everything. <clears throat> okay, I'm asking you to do something that's quite unusual, aren't I? Mm. <laughs> I know. What are you crying for? I'm not. <laughs> you are. Don't cry. <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. I'll do the best I can for him. And I'm sorry if it's not bloody good enough. I think you've done a great job so far. Oh. See, now I don't know what she's got upset about. It's all right, it's all right. We'll sort that it's out. It's all right. Okay. I've done something wrong by being a bit emotional. Sorry, Kay, I meant to sit here like stone. 
So what's the matter? OK. Why but... have you got the strap on, Kate? Because you're sitting there crying. There's nothing to cry over. What are you getting upset about? Well, I'm allowed to. Can I'm a fucking adult. I know, but I'm saying there's no reason for you to get upset. Can I get upset if I give a one? Donna. Hold on. I don't need her talking to me like I'm a kid. I'm not, but you said I'm upset when you think it don't make me want to be upset. Yeah, it does, cos you're being stupid over nothing. What I think that you... that Kay needs to hear is what you're feeling. Cos I'm here to support you all, yeah, and I want to know why you're upset. Because I am. Because at the end of the day, it makes me feel like I've done a lousy job with them. End of. What are you crying for now, Kay? Cos I'm angry cos you've given me the ump. Yeah, but why have I given you the ump? <clears throat> I walked out, Mum, yeah, because I don't want to see you sitting there crying, yeah, feeling sorry for yourself, saying that you've done a lousy job because you haven't, yeah. I come back in and what do I get? Oh, boy, walking out for what you cry, mm -hmm. I don't get an answer. Oh, OK, why are you crying? I get shade out, I get a map somewhere. Yeah, because you back? go out and she's Hold on away. one minute. She just said something quite important to you there, that yes. she does not think you're a lousy mother. And she's crying because you were upset because you think you're a lousy mother. And that's your daughter saying she doesn't think you are. Oh, it's my turn to get up on me. Thanks, Kay. I'm glad you think I'm not lousy. But... <sighs> now she's making it out like as if we're really, really bad and as if we don't love her, as if we treat her like we don't respect her or nothing. But it ain't like that. <sighs> all right. You all right, Donna? Yeah. Oh, OK, you can have a fair go. <laughs> Thanks. Are we all back, yeah? Yeah. OK. <laughs> it's only been about. one session, and there's a lot for the family to think about. I think it went really well. I mean, I did... I've never really got a chance to speak to anyone like that before. I think doing the things that she talked about to me would help me, but it would be quite a struggle and hard to do at first. If Amber could be a bit more honest, with May and Kay could be a bit more, le less stroppy, you know, and I can stop being so screwed up around them. You know, we might get somewhere. I just hope that they do go away and that they do use some of this, some of what we've spoken about today, because I really do think that they're two good kids who really want to do the best and with a bit of encouragement that they will really be able to turn the family around. It's now been a few weeks since the teen taming. Pasta's not on the bloody menu. I'm on the chips. I'll fill up the chips, please. And the family have had some time to think about what's gone on. I could just see by Kay's eyes that there's stuff there that she didn't want to say in front of Sarah or anyone else. When we got home, <laughs> me and her just had a little talk on our own. There was no shouting, no swearing <laughs> for once. <laughs> right, hold on a minute. What am I doing for breakfast? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. And the spirit of compromise has spread to the girls as well. I think it's calmed down a lot. Over there's still arguments, but it ain't as bad. I think my sister finds it easier to speak to me more now. There's a lot more verbal, talkative language between everyone and not just shouting. <laughs> <laughs> it's enjoyable. I enjoy the girls coming home from school and having them around me now. So yeah, it's all it's all good good stuff. At some time, nearly all teenagers dream of adventure, but hardly any of them ever do anything about it. Monday morning, and 14-year-old Lancashire schoolboy Jamie Gleave should have been at lessons, not 200 miles away on his way south. I just decided to just go on an adventure, if you can call it that. Well, at first we were just like, oh, he's not going to do it, it's fine, just don't say anything. But then when he didn't turn up at school, everyone was like, oh, my God, he has actually done it. It may have seemed an adventure to Jamie, but his parents didn't see it quite the same way. As the day goes on, you get more and more worried. Losing a child, every parent's nightmare. It was a scheme he dreamt up weeks earlier with a group of his friends. I just felt as if life was boring, there was nothing... Nothing to look forward to the next day, basically, so... And so the escape committee was born. For the friends, it was time to get the hell out of town. I was the ringleader of it, of course, but together we planned to go to Paris. It's often a fantasy for all of us to get away from sort of everyday life. There was only a couple of us which were serious, and 
even to the end of that, there was only me that was serious, so I decided to go by myself. With his mates all backing out, the adventure was now a solo mission, and Jamie had to come up with a brand new escape plan. The great escape, things to take, coat, red, phone. With the plans, plan there were a few obstacles in the way, passport, money, just the essentials really that I needed to get. They were year olds, uh, and they'd been there for months, and uh, they just disappeared on the Sunday night. Next, Jamie swiped his passport. He was on a roll. I finalised all my plans. I had everything I needed to get, and it was just getting there that was the problem now. 8.30 a.m., his first destination, London, Euston. Jamie's mission had begun. You need a ticket, so a lot of other people do it as well. You hide in the toilets to avoid the ticket collector. Meanwhile, Jamie's mum, Claire, had found a note. I just told her what I intended to do, with no locations, obviously, um, and said farewell. It was devastating. Once I'd written the note, it was obvious that he'd been planning this for some time. I had something set aside and I wanted to do that and I wasn't letting anything get in my way. But the police had other ideas. After talking to his classmates, they knew they had to stop him leaving the country. That's when I started to w worry, really, because I knew that it was something serious and it wasn't just a big joke. We were very confident that we would eventually uh, trace Jamie and bring him home safe and well. With police and customs on alert across the country, could Jamie manage to slip the net? I realised that there was a massive obstacle in front of me. Obviously, they're not going to let a 14-year-old child across, so I had a few plans. He'd obviously thought about how he would do it and what would happen if somebody stopped him. Now in Dover, Jamie needed to think on his feet. How could he sneak onto the ferry? I tagged onto a family, pretending that the family were my family, and I got through passport control. Despite the best efforts of the CID, as well as the customs authorities across nearly 40 ports and airports, Jamie had managed to give them all the slip. I'm here, I've made it. What's next? Three hours and a 40 euro train journey later, Paris was next. I felt as if I'd achieved something. I'd set a goal out to get there and I'd got there. People were laughing and joking and walking around, kids my age. It felt magical in a way. It might have been one big jaunt to Jamie, but at home his parents were distraught. It's just horrendous, just wondering where, where he was. You just imagine the worst. Anything could have happened to him. You, you start to get a little bit concerned because obviously another evening's approaching. Jamie thought he'd had the whole plan worked out. My thinking did change later that day. Where was he going to sleep? And it was just scary, really. Now down to his last few euros, there was every reason to feel scared. Being of my age, I didn't think as if adults would even respect me or talk to me, even if I, even if I wanted to find a hostel or a something. By this point, it was late, very late into the evening. It was in the minuses, the weather was cold, and that was the worst fear of just having nowhere to stay, strangers around me. After a terrible night, Jamie's plans for a long stay in France needed a serious rethink. Basically, my options were carry on travelling, stay in Paris, Another option was to hand myself in. After a long, hard think, um, I handed myself in at a police station in Paris. You're English, and I was like, OK, yes, I am. Um, get me home. Jamie came back home to a somewhat mixed reception. Jamie was on a high. He was uh, very sure of himself, a little bit a little bit too cocky for, for the what he'd been up to. He wouldn't think he'd done anything wrong at all, the way, he, the way he was acting. He just walked in as if he'd just been to his friend's house. I think it was just, you know, wow, someone's actually gone to France from our school. I don't think he appreciated what he'd put people through. But uh, that's teenagers for you. Our intrepid explorer was in two minds. When I look back, 
I do condemn what I did, but at the same time, proud of myself. Paul Johnson looks as though butter wouldn't melt in his mouth, but looks can deceive. Well, I don't terrorise everyone. I only terrorise people who terrorise me. When I'm pissed, I just can't help it. I just start for no reason. The worst thing I, um, I've been nicked for is beating up someone and pulling out a knife. I think I've been nicked about 16 times. 15-year-old Paul has become a one-boy crime wave. This parade of shops in Southampton has been his hunting ground. Don't use that for our oh, use the, use man the shops are a favourite hangout for local groups of teenagers. <laughs> you do nothing. You've got everything you want at other people's expense. All of you. Paul Johnson is a member of a gang of youths that um, have great delight in congregating outside the shop. He has a history of terrorising of customers, uh, intimidation of staff, uh, and general low-grade theft. He's barred from every shop round here. Not allowed in any of the shops round here because he just walks in pinches what he wants and out he goes again. We need help. We don't want them on the parade. They're killing the parade. And these people that live on this estate rely on these shops. Paul's offending hasn't just been confined to the shops. This is Pete Mitchell's new burger van. His old one had a visit from Paul. He just, like, broke into it and started robbing it. Threw eggs all around the car park, squirted that sauce all over the van and they sat on the roof eating my chocolate bars. You see them eat my chocolate bars. This time, stealing wasn't quite enough. I lit it first, and then he lit it the other, like a bit of tissue in a second. Bergram was burning up. It was hot as anything. It was a mountain. And that was, uh, that was my van gone. The house I'm living in now, uh, um, I moved in there and there was a load of kids all jumping in the back of the van, you know, it just didn't know about like they do because there's murder up in the estate. And, uh, and they said, what do you do for a living there? And I said, I've got a burger van down the road there. They said, oh, we know someone that burnt that down. I said, who's that? And he said, that, that one over there. I said, oi, come here, you burn my burger van down. And he just looked at me and said, well, which one? You know, he didn't have a care on the world, do you know what I mean? And what did he say about the fact you burned his van down? I'm a little shit. <laughs> But with arson now included in his list of 66 offences, the authorities decided to act. The court handed out an ASBO, or antisocial behaviour order. It was Paul's last chance to behave. If I don't, and if I breach it too, twice, I'll go to prison. His ASBO includes all kinds of restrictions. Well, I can't go out to shop, I can't go out to the park, I can't play football, I can't swear at anyone, I can't rob any motorbikes, I can't ride any motorbikes. If I go down there, I'll go to prison. Cut off from his gang, Paul now has time to kill. Luckily, his pets take a lot of his attention. I watched all my films and I completed all my games. There's nothing else to do. He does have one other big hobby. I spend all my pocket money on beers and pot. I drink anything. If I had a beer, I'd drink it. I smoke pot beyond the garages, round my way. We smoke them by doing shotties. This is the shotty what we use. You put um, like, the fag in this tube and then just bring the pot in there. And then you suck it really hard and it just goes straight up your, in your mouth and down in your lungs. And, get, and it gets you stoned. His mother takes a controversial view towards his drug taking. Paul do like his cannabis. Quietens him down, I reckon. Because all he wants to do then is come home, have a munch and go to sleep. Paul can't wait to be free. I'm doing everything what they tell me to do, so I, I reckon I'll be able to get this as bit off me soon. But his victims aren't in the same hurry. They don't want to see Paul with the gangs again. I've got a good business, I've been here eight years, and I don't see why I should be intimidated. But Paul won't be back on the scene any time soon. His ASBO must last at least two years before there's any chance of his case being reassessed. In the meantime, 
Perhaps an apology might help to mend fences. Is there anything else you want to say? I mean, this is your opportunity to sort of say anything you want to say about things you put your mother through, people you've terrorised. Is there anything you want to say at all? No. Nothing you want to say at all? No. It's easy to get shocked by teenagers, but ask yourself, where does their wild behaviour come from? And once they're adults, where does it all go? Here are the Vickers family. Jake, at 11, is a mini teenager who likes metal music. Alfie's 13, into skateboarding and heavy metal. Connor's 15, a skateboarder and loves very heavy metal. Now meet Mum Leslie, not quite a teenager, but she might as well be. Inside, I'm still, I'm still 17, 18. I think, like, with dyeing my hair, having my nose pierced, it's all about showing, like, getting noticed. And that's obviously rubbed up on, on my boys. When your mum used to be a punk, there's a lot to live up to. But the Vickers boys generally rise to the challenge. I allowed them to decorate their own room. This is the graffiti wall. We've got a spray can, graffiti all over it, because we do what we want. I just want it has to be like I want it, not like my friends want it. And if they want to complain, then they complain. I don't care. Six weeks holiday, I let them cut their hair into Mohicans and dye it whatever colour they want. So what? I really like the way my mum is because she's always letting us do stuff. She's She does get embarrassed sometimes, but usually she doesn't really care. And the boys are even capable of shocking their mum, like they did on a recent birthday. <laughs> I was told, we've got you the perfect present. And I thought it was a mobile phone, because that's what I really wanted, a mobile phone. No. Like many sons, they decided to get something they wanted, and they wanted a pet. I'm not a lover of gerbils or guinea pigs or rabbits. So what pet do you get for a two-up, two-down? <coughs> they come home with this pig. Barbie. <laughs> she was very small when we first had her. She was only the size of, like, a terrier dog. And I thought, great, I got a harness. I was going to take her out for walks and stuff like that. Unfortunately, she didn't stop growing. And she's about 22 stone now. But she's lovely. And it's almost like having another child. You turn her off and she'll sulk. But the baby of the family can't join in with all their adventures. Today, Leslie and the boys are off on a day trip to London. I'd rather they were outrageous with me there than being outrageous without me, cos I'd feel left out. Ow! I feel good! <laughs> For the Vickers boys, a train carriage is just another adventure playground. It's not so bad if you go weekends, cos trains are empty. No! No! Oh! But if, if you're going up during the day when, like, the trains are busy and got all these suited and booted people on there and my lot come on with their skateboards and they don't <laughs> like that it. Is that your board? What, are you letting him on it? I think as long as you don't put too many restrictions on them, give them a bit of free rein, I don't think they will go too far. They've only got one stop to go. Mind your boards. Mum wants to visit the capital of punk. Oh, that one, yeah. But the boys have other ideas. Mum, you need a skateboard. It I don't need a skateboard. Speed metal wrecking balls. Left to false metal. Yeah, I like that one. Mum, can I borrow 118 pounds? But however much she wants to be part of the gang, Leslie still faces the same problems as other mums. No, it's no good asking for money off your Christmas money to get something now. I want blue ones. No, you can't have blue ones. Yeah. No, yeah, 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 no. yeah. No. How about no? Oh, oh, my God. God. oh, oh Al, that's Look. enough. For some, life with high energy teens would be hell, but not for Leslie. Some people might think we're crazy and wacky, but I really wouldn't have it any other way. I'm not wacky or weird. I'm just unique. We're individual. We act like we want to. No one else does. That's their problem, not us. If you can, try not to have nightmares about your teenagers. No matter how weird they seem, they probably won't end up behind bars.
the majority will mature, take out the piercings, turn sensible, and all will be well. Until, of course, they have those terrible teens of their own.